So I want to talk about preparation of the patient for awake intubation. And we're, we're not talking about blocks. Preparation does not mean airway blocks. It doesn't mean topical anesthesia, okay? It means preparation of the entire patient. Awake does not mean smash, wasted, and classical coma score three. I'm not talking about a patient who I've sedated, so they're essentially asleep. I'm talking about a patient who maybe they're sedated, but they're cooperative, they're aware, but maybe they have amnesia, which is a great thing. But most importantly, they can control their own airway. Okay, they're in control. I don't want a patient who is out of it. And awake intubation is not synonymous with fiber optic intubation. Awake intubation can be done with any device that you do in the asleep patient. Upper picture, we have a Claris video system, optical stylet, video stylet. In the lower, we have a King Vision channel scope being used to intubate these patients. It does not have to be. In fact, all the pictures that you just saw go by, I've used to intubate patients awake. Good literature on this. This was a, a 2012 comparing a flexible scope with a McGrath laryngoscope. Studies using the Pentax airway scope, the um, uh, CMAC, the Glide scope, King Vision in various clinical situations. Success rates and time to intubation were the same. This is a meta-analysis, again, looking at flexible scope versus video laryngoscope. Failure rate, first attempt, success, patient satisfaction, adverse events, all the same. You don't have to wait for your flexible scope to be available, or maybe you're not comfortable with the flexible scope to do an awake intubation. You can use a video laryngoscope. The advantage of video laryngoscopy awake intubation, it tends to be a more familiar technique. You can practice video laryngoscopy every single day in the operating room. It gives you this wider view. The picture on the right is the view through a flexible scope, and you have, tend to have this narrow view. With a video laryngoscope, you have a wider view. It gives you a better idea of what's going on in that airway. You don't have the problem with hang-up. We're gonna talk about hang-up in detail, but you don't have the problem with a um, mismatch of your flexible scope diameter and your internal diameter of your tracheal tube getting hung up on the upper airway structures. And if you think about it, when you're using a flexible scope to intubate a patient, you never see the tracheal tube go through the cords. If we look at this picture of a flexible scope being used for intubation, the operator is about to push the tracheal tube over that flexible scope into the larynx. You'll never see it. You're, looking at, you're busy looking at the crina. But if you're using a video laryngoscope, you actually see the tracheal tube pass into the larynx, another advantage. We can use supraglottic airways. This is a intubating LMA, and we can use these devices, these intubating supraglottic airways, to intubate patients awake. This patient's wide awake and is being intubated with a fast-track LMA. Any device used in the asleep patient can be used in the awake patient. That's your second bell. That's one of the take-home lessons I think I hope you walk away with. Um, a question I'm often asked is, has the availability of video laryngoscopy eliminated awake intubation? Plenty of clinicians said to me, you know, I have a glide scope now, I don't have to do awake intubation anymore. This is one of my favorite authors, is J. Adam Law. And what he did at his institution is he looked at the incidence of awake intubation over a 12-year period. During that 12-year period, they had 145,000 general anesthetics, and they had an incidence of 1.06% awake intubation. And during that 12-year period, this practice incorporated more and more video laryngoscopy as that curve goes up. But yet, during the 12 years, as they used more and more video laryngoscopy, the instance of awake intubation did not change. What did change is the perception of which patients needed awake intubation. And I think that's the real key, is that we now have a better understanding of which patients require awake intubation. Um, Incidence of 1.06% over 12 years. Study in 2016, 1.3%. Study in 2017, 1.17%. All different groups still maintain that about 1% incidence of awake intubation with more and more video laryngoscopy. We're going to look at awake intubation with a five, uh, actually a six finger model. And those six fingers are explanation, desiccation, dilatation, topicalization sedation. The six things that I look at equally when I'm doing an awake intubation. Oh, sorry, procrastination is the last one. 
And in this case, we really mean procrastination is, is time management. So explanation, what does Mickey say? Mickey says safety first, and patients really understand safety. Patients come and they trust you, but what they want more than anything else is to be safe at the end of the procedure. And when I decided that the patient needs an awake intubation, I'll explain it to them in terms of safety. I don't hold anything back. I'm gonna explain the procedure to them. And I tell them that your anatomy differs from normal. In order to keep you safe, I need to take a look with an instrument. We're going to take our time. We're gonna make your throat numb like the dentist does, but I'm not gonna use needles like the dentist does unless I have to. And you're gonna meet my dentist in a little bit. Okay, desiccation. So explanation, desiccation. Use a drying agent every single time unless there's a contraindication. And those contraindications include closed angle glaucoma and compromising atrial arrhythmias. And the reason we use a drying agent is that saliva is a barrier to your topical anesthetic. And Anest local anesthetics, topical anesthetics are poison. They poison sodium channels. The body doesn't like that. So when you start introducing topical anesthetic into the airway, more secretions are made. The secretions cover the mucosa. They prevent your local anesthetic from reaching the mucosa. They protect the mucosa, they dilute the concentration of your topical anesthetic, and they remove it. The patient, the patient has saliva, they, they swallow the topical anesthetic, they drool it out, they're gonna remove it. This is an airway that was not prepared. This is an airway that's wet. It's gonna be very difficult to get a block on this airway because there's so much saliva in that airway. Secondly, they're gonna obscure your view. If you're using an optical device, a video device, Secretions are going to block your view, be able to see the anatomy. And lastly, they're going to stimulate the larynx. You're going to get more laryngospasm, more cough if you have saliva in the airway. So use a drying agent. My favorite is 0.2 to 0.4 milligrams of glycopyrrolate. I do it in my holding area. I don't wait for the OR. If I do it in the OR, I'm too late. I do it in the holding area. Start early. I'm going to dry up my secretions. I'm going to apply my anesthetic and uh, get a numb patient. Dilatation. Dilatation is a reminder to me to remind you to always prepare the nose no matter how you're planning to intubate that patient. I always prepare the nose unless there's a contraindication. Epistasis, coagulopathy, HHT, pregnancy, anatomic obstruction. Otherwise, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give them a vasoconstrictor in the nose. Now, why do I always prepare the nose? No matter how, if I, even if I'm absolutely planning an oral intubation, I always prepare the nose because number one, local anesthetic of the nose is eventually, eventually going to reach the pharynx. It's going to help with your pharyngeal block. Two, it can be done while you wait. While I'm waiting for my desiccant to work, my glycopyrrolate to work, I can be preparing, on the, preparing the nose. There's no saliva in the nose, so I can prepare the nose. And number three, if I have a plan change. Let's say um, I get into the operating room doing an, an oral intubation and the patient has just too much gag. There's less gag reflex elicited when I intubate with a flexible scope through the nose. So if I just can't block out that gag reflex, I'll go through the nose and the nose is already prepared. So this is a nasal mucosa has not been vasoconstricted. It's very pink. There's going to be blood vessels there. There's not a lot of room to work. And I'm going to cause bleeding and I might be causing pain if I haven't done a topical anesthetic block. Here, this is a nasal mucosa that's been blocked. It's very pale, there's more room. I'm gonna be, get, be able to get back to the nasopharynx more easily, cause less pain. Now we're gonna look at this patient. This is a patient who had a history of superlaryngeal cancer many years ago, got um, chemo radiation and I think surgery. Uh, and then years later presented to an outside hospital with an avascular necrosis in the cervical spine. And he was having lateralizing signs. So immediately, they put him into a non-invasive collar, and they brought him to the operating room. They tried to intubate him awake. They failed. They induced anesthesia, which was a bad idea, because he had a known uh, cervical spine uh, injury, and they still couldn't intubate him. So he was transferred to Yale. He was transferred to Yale as an impossible intubation. He was going to need a, an awake tracheostomy before he could have his cervical spine uh, fixed. He, of course, went ahead and got an awake intubation, but we're gonna, we're gonna use him as a model for awake intubation, and we're gonna see his intubation later. Then he had his cervical spine fixed. Okay, you can see the hardware that's in there now, 
And then he represented for another procedure years later. And you can see how difficult his airway is. A lot of radiation changes. He's got a fixed cervical spine. He had a degree of trismus. So he's still in awake intubation. Preparing the nose is easy. I'm going to use Afrin. Um, Afrin is actually better than phenylephrine. It gives you a more profound block. It gives you a longer block. I'm going to start early. I'm going to start in the holding area. I'm not going to wait till I get to the OR. Now, why would I do an intubation versus a wake or sleep via the nose or not via the nose? Why would I intubate someone through the nose? Well, the first reason it's easier. Especially if you're using a flexible scope, it's easier to intubate through the nose. It's a better course for the flexible scope to take than the acute angle that has to be taken if you intubate through the oral cavity. There's, as I mentioned, reduced gag. Gag tends to live in the posterior pharyngeal wall. If I'm coming through an oral route, my devices are coming right up against the pharyngeal wall. If I'm coming through the nose, they're actually hitting the pharyngeal wall tangentially. There's less gag reflex. Let's say the surgeon tells me that they're going to rubber band or wire the mouth shut, and I don't have access to the oral aperture. That means I'm going to need a nasal intubation. Well, why not? Why would I avoid the nose? The primary reason is trauma. And I might get bleeding if I try to intubate through the nose. And if I get bleeding, that's going to ruin the attempts of intubation with all my other optical devices. Pain, sinusitis, bacteremia, turbinectomy, retropharyngeal dissection have all been reported with nasal intubation. I actually prefer to stay away from the nose as much as possible. I'll always intubate through the mouth, awake or asleep, unless there's a, a good reason, as we discussed, or a surgical requirement. Topicalization. Now, when I teach topicalization of the airway, and you notice it is topicalization, it's not needle block, what I do is I, I divide the airway into three parts. By the way, I forgot to mention that the reverse side of your card talks about my, my avoid intubation. So, so topicalization. Cover three areas. Just plan to cover three areas. Those areas are nasal, oropharyngeal, hypopharyngeal, and tracheal. And I'm going to do at least one block for each one of these areas. And I'm going to start my blocks in the holding area. I'm not going to wait until I get to the OR. If I wait to the OR, it's going to take OR time up. I'd much rather do it and have the patient prepared by the time we get to the OR. And we're going to look at this in terms of nerve supply, location, and the effect we're trying to block. So the nerve supply for the nasal area is the trigeminal nerve. It's the nasal mucosa as location, and the effect we're blocking is simple pain. And if we look at the nerve, at the nose, excuse me, the anterior ethmoid nerve innervates the anterior one third of the nose. The lateral nasal palatine nerves innervate the posterior two thirds of the nose, and they will pierce the palate and innervate the underside of the hard and soft palate. I simply like to take cotton swabs that are loaded with the local anesthetic of my choice putting them back until I hit the sphenoid bone. And I let them sit there. And on the way, the local anesthetic will hit the mucosa anteriorly. It'll diffuse, get my anterior ethmoid nerve block. And then against sphenoid bone, I will, which I feel like a click, almost like you're doing a bad epidural, I, I will get the lateral nasal T nerve blocks. And here's that cotton swab going into this patient. And if we pretend we're the swab going in, we will see that I have to forward. So we're, we're going to try and stay underneath the turbinates. So there we see the inferior turbinate. And I prefer to be underneath that turbinate as much as possible. So there we're finally getting underneath the turbinate. And I'm going to go all the way back with my swab until I come right up against the nasopharyngeal wall and I can feel the bone of the sphenoid. And here's our patient. I'm going to use a technique I call push to pain. I'm going to put this swab in until the patient winces. And once they pin, wince, I'm going to step back. I never want to hurt my patient. So I'm going to step back. I'm going to let that local anesthetic diffuse to kind of melt away and diffuse. And then I'll come back a minute later, and I'll go a little bit further. Some patients are going to go all the way back to the sphenoid bone. Other patients, it's going to take 5, 10 minutes to get back there. But I never want my patient to have pain. My favorite agent is this. It's lidocaine ointment. It's 50 milligrams per half an inch. And I'll use a half an inch on both sides of the, of the nose. If I don't have my 5% ointment, I'll use 2% viscous or injectable lidocaine. So in this case, I didn't have my ointment. So what I'm, I have a syringe with a plastic catheter. I've shown the patient that it's plastic. It's not a needle. Patients don't like needles. And I'm simply injecting 50 milligrams 
on both sides of the nose. Let's turn to the mouth, the oropharyngeal cavity. It's the glossopharyngeal nerve. We're blocking the, um, the locations of the pharyngeal wall, the posterior one-third of the tongue, and we're blocking primarily the gag reflex. And you see in the diagrams, this is the area we're trying to block here, innervated by the glossopharyngeal nerve. And if we look at the patient's mouth, you see the palatal glossal arch, the arch of tissue that goes from the palate to the tongue, palatal glossal, and the nerve lives just on the backside of that arch. And I can take my cotton swabs, and since I'm a reasonably nice guy, I'll use new cotton swabs, and I can put it right against the back of that arch on both sides. Once again, I'll use 50 milligrams of local anesthetic of lidocaine on both sides of that arch. So, so far we've used 200 milligrams. Now this is Dr. Goldberg. Dr. Goldberg's my dentist. And he taught me a neat trick that I use in every awake intubation, and that is control of the tongue. So what he does is when he does an exam of my mouth, he takes a cotton gauze, he folds it very neatly longitudinally, puts it on my chin, asks me to stick out my tongue, and then he wraps up my tongue. And by wrapping up my tongue, he now has control. And he can move that tongue to one side, and he can go ahead and put, or I can put, a swab against that palatal arch. So here I have the tongue pulled to the side, swab with local anesthetic, and I'm putting it right against that arch. Here's our friend. <clears throat> Got to wrap up his tongue very neatly. And this time I'm going to use push to, pain, push to gag, excuse me, push to gag. I never want my patient to have an unpleasant experience, so as soon as this disturbs him, I'm going to back off. I'll come back a minute later and go a little further against that arch. But I never want to cause him difficulty. In this case, I didn't have my swabs or my ointment. I took a gauze pad, soaked it with local anesthetic, put it right against that arch. Now let's turn to the hypopharynx, larynx, and trachea. It's the vagus nerve. We're the locations of the hypopharynx, larynx, and trachea, and we're blocking larignant spasm and cough reflex. And this was a technique that was taught to me by um, an olaryngologist, where he takes a syringe of viscous or solution of lidocaine on a plastic catheter, once again shows the patient that the catheter is not a needle. Very important. Patients don't like needles. And he's going to place it over the tongue and very slowly let the anesthetic just slide over the back of the tongue. And the patient's going to aspirate that local anesthetic, and they're going to cough. And when they cough, I say, coughing is good. Coughing means that the local anesthetic is getting to the point that I need it, that we need to have. And I'm going to use about 100 milligrams of local anesthetic. And you can see in the foreground down here, once again, I have a gauze pad, and I'm pulling the tongue forward. But I'm not pulling the tongue forward in order to get to the anatomy. I'm pulling the tongue forward for a different reason. And that is that I pull the tongue forward, the patient can't swallow. And I don't want them to swallow. I want them to aspirate. I want that local anesthetic to get into their larynx and trachea, holding their tongue forward. And I'll often just stand there holding the tongue. It may take five minutes while I'm depositing the local anesthetic. So here I'll do this with this patient. I'll hold the tongue forward. I'm going to put the catheter over the, over the tongue. I'm explaining to her what's going on. And I'm just going to let the local anesthetic drip on the back of the tongue. Maybe I'll kind of paint from side to side, let it drip down, get into the vollecula, go around the vollecula and epiglottis, and, and have the patient aspirate. If there's a, another technique, is the, the, this is the magic uh, atomizer, um, a nice way to locally uh, atomize local anesthetic. I can pull the tongue forward, atomize into the larynx. Additionally, if my, my tool of choice is the flexible scope, I can use the ovisapien catheter. The ovisapien catheter is nothing more than a epidural catheter that's being placed through the working channel of your flexible scope. So here I am placing the flexible catheter through the working channel. Every, every scope except for the very smallest have a working channel. It's now coming from the bottom and I'm depositing local anesthetic. So here I have a beautiful view of the larynx and I can take my epidural catheter and I can de decide exactly where I need more local anesthetic. In this case, this patient has a tracheal stenosis, laryngeal stenosis. I don't think the patient's ready for my flexible scope yet, but I can place my catheter through that stenosis and I can deposit local anesthetic below the, below the larynx to get that patient ready. 
Here's the catheter coming out. If I'm using a video laryngoscope, I can once again use these atomizers to deposit local anesthetic on the larynx before I go ahead and do my intubation. Um, and, and you might have noticed I, I'm, I tend to use lidocaine in all these topical techniques. There's so many different local anesthetics. Why do I choose lidocaine? And the reason is that lidocaine comes in multiple preparations. Solution, viscous jelly, ointment, there's a lidocaine spray. And it also comes in multiple concentrations. And I can do easy dose calculations. I can know how much lidocaine I actually gave my patient through the topical route. And there are studies on this. In this study, they applied 400 milligrams of topical anesthetic to patients' airways, and they measured the, um, the, blood, the highest blood level. And after an hour, they had a blood level of 0.5 micrograms per ml. They used as their benchmark toxic level four micrograms per ml. That's a, a common benchmark. And so you can see that with 400 milligrams, excuse me, I said micrograms, milligrams, they were well below the toxic level. If they used 800 milligrams of local anesthetic, they were still only half of the toxic blood level after an hour. Now, there are other techniques like using atomized lidocaine. And I used to use atomized lidocaine quite a bit, but I stopped doing it for one because of these studies. Because if I atomize 400 milligrams of lidocaine, I'm getting now close to the toxic level. And if I use double that, 800 milligrams, I'm frankly toxic. And the explanation for that is simple. If I'm using atomized lidocaine, I'm getting the lidocaine or the local anesthetic further down into the tracheobronchial tree, and I'm getting much more absorption. And there's been some studies looking at um, pharmacokinetics of this where the bioavailability of atomized lidocaine um, is far higher than mucosal lidocaine. So that's why I've abandoned the atomized technique. Still a good technique. Um, I'm going to take another step back and, and give one other explanation. That is that I'm not saying that this technique is the way to prepare patients for intubation. If you've got an awake intubation technique that you like, I don't want to change it. But if you have, if you need a, another technique for doing awake innovation, that's why I'm offering this. A lot of people are very satisfied with the technique they're using, and that's fine. Um, invasive blocks. I'm not going to talk about invasive blocks. I can't tell you anything about invasive blocks that you can't get on YouTube, in fact, on the Airway On Demand channel, um, or in, in a million other resources. Right now, my videos are down for a reason having to do for the, uh, the book, but they'll be back up again. But again, um, Patients don't like needles, so I've abandoned. I haven't used needles for invasive blocks in over a decade because I, I can do it all with topical blocks. Invasive blocks are use, absolutely useful. They're rarely needed, I believe. They're not always practical in the worst airways like these patients that we saw earlier. Um, it can be very difficult to do invasive blocks. This guy has a fungating lesion right near, right over the um, uh, superior, the internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. Um, no surgeons want, it's going to want you to stick a needle through that, through that lesion. So a needle block is out of the question there. But paradoxically, the worst airways can be the easiest to block. This guy has had surgery and radiation. He has very little salivation. He probably has surgical analgesia, very little gag reflex. When a patient like this presents to the holding area and they look like a horrible airway, they can be the easiest patients to do awake intubation on very commonly. Sedation. Andy Ovasapien, as I said, we lost Andy in 2010. What did Andy say about sedation for awake intubation? He said, when planning sedation for awake intubation, the patient typically requires less midazolam than the anesthesiologist. And I think this is extraordinarily true. I think most of the sedation we give is for us. If we do a good technique, we don't need sedation. And of course, if we oversedate patients, we're putting them in a dangerous situation where we could be causing apnea in a very difficult airway. There's two general categories, the anxiolytics, which calm the patient, give some amnesia, but should not substitute with a good relationship, a good rapport with the patient. And the analgesics, which can supplement our anal local anesthetic block and give us cough suppression. As a general rule, we titrate carefully. We mix as few agents as possible. We always want to maintain that patient cooperative with us. We want to have the patient cooperative with our procedures. In Andy's mind, the patient should be lightly asleep if unstimulated, but 
able to respond to commands and able to carry out simple instructions. That was his ideal sedation. Nick Woodall from uh, the UK believes that sedation is really not essential to awake intubation. We can do it all with just having a good rapport with the patient and um, good blocks. Benzodiazepines, I use very little, maybe two milligrams at most, four milligrams of the patient who's benzodiazepine uh, tolerant. Propofol is not a good drug for awake intubation. The window between cough suppression and apnea is very narrow, so it's really not a very good drug. Uh, you can easily overstate patients. Opioids are used to supplement your local anesthetic block and again give cough suppression, but really should not be your primary analgesic. And I rarely use more than 50, milligram, 50 micrograms of fentanyl. Um, fent Remy fentanyl I'll use if I already have a Remy fentanyl drip all set up for a, a Tiva, let's say, but I use very low dose. And um, dexmedetomidine is also a good drug in this case, but I'll give you one caution. That is, I had several people, uh, clinicians, who really felt they couldn't do an awake intubation until they got hold of dexmedetomidine, and suddenly they were doing what they call awake intubations and what they were really doing was sedating the patient, having a, a sleep, spontaneously breathing patient. And, and that's not awake intubation. And you would never do that with someone with, let's say, a, a full stomach who's a difficult airway. So you have to be cautious with it. It can help with some sedation, but should not be a substitute for a good awake intubation. And of course, we, we bolus and we start an infusion. My personal regimen, 80% of the time, I'm using a small amount of midazolam, a small amount of fentanyl, and that's it. Um, Few times I'll use midazolam and remifentanil if I'm doing a TIVA, and occasionally dexmedetomidine tends to be what I'm teaching more than anything else. 100% of the time I'm not relying on sedation, I'm relying on, on good blocks and a good rapport. Procrastination. Procrastination is really time management. Um, if you decided upon awake intubation, you decided upon awake intubation for reasons of safety, and you shouldn't be rushing what you're doing. If safety is the main issue, then nothing else really matters, including the pressure of the operating room. So I start my preparation well outside the operating room. I'm gonna do my explanation and my desiccation in the admitting area. I'll do my topical anesthetics in the holding area or directly outside the operating room. If someone complains about a delay, I tell them I've already gotten started. I'm already working on that patient. And if someone complains about safety, I ask that when they go to the dentist's office and the dentist injects you with local anesthetic and a vasoconstrictor, are they monitoring you? Do you have an IV? No. Especially, you know, those, it's still safe. I'm using topical techniques and they're, they're very safe. I like to get upper airway analgesia before I go in through that door into the operating room. And I like to see that I can put an oral airway at least two thirds into the mouth before I'll go into the operating room. That's my, my standard for saying I'm, I'm ready to, uh, just about to intubate and I'll get in the operating room. If, if you're planning more invasive blocks, they should be done in a monitored environment. Even though your dentist doesn't do it, you should do it in a monitored environment. So the key to awake intubation, have a plan. Explanation, desiccation, dilatation, topicalization, station, procrastination. If I can find room for one more finger, I'm thinking about adding preparation. Not only with the awake technique, but also with the devices you might want to use, like a flexible scope. There's a lot of things you have to get ready. And you don't want to be running around getting these things ready as you're preparing the patient. So really think about preparation. I run around with this, because I do so many awake intubations, I have a kit with everything I need for awake intubation. Um, you don't have to go that far, but I think it's prepare everything you need ahead of time. And of course, it's much more complicated than that, right? It's a complicated technique. Um, I do the exact same thing with every patient. Uh, I don't vary it based upon the pathology or the technique I'm going to use to intubate and um, it becomes very comfortable for the patient, uh, very cons being very consistent. Take your time, cover three areas, one, two, three. Don't get hung up on the needle blocks. You don't need needles, and your patient doesn't want them. 